Hi, hello, and welcome back to Prudential's Inside Baseball. I'm George Grant. We'll take a look behind the scenes this week on Prudential's Inside Baseball to see what training does to Major League Baseball players. We'll also take a look at some of the milestones, and we'll also take a look at the return to Cincinnati of Pete Rose. Faced with the prospect of his chase for Ty Cobb's hitting streak, possibly going by the boards with not the opportunity of playing regularly, Rose opted for the opportunity to continue to play and to manage as well. It was Pete Rose going back to Cincinnati, not as a player, not just as a manager, but as a player manager. For the folks in Cincinnati and for Rose, it was a big week. In an effort to remind fans of the times when the Reds were big winners during the 70s, Cincinnati management has brought back the most famous Red of them all, Pete Rose. As player manager, Rose marked his first series by going 8 for 15 in a three-game set against the Cubs. The hot hitting and patented hustle were no longer just a memory at Riverfront. I, I've hit here so many times with, with, with ovations. Uh, you, you know, you sort of, you appreciate it, but uh, when you play somewhere where you really appreciate the fans, you, I don't want to say you expect it, but uh, it was a big moment for me. But, uh, you know, I don't, I don't get so wrapped up in something I f try to I forget what I'm trying to accomplish when I'm in the batter's box. I think we're going to see some good aggressive ball and and I think that uh, you know when you got a guy that's in his early 40s going out and playing baseball as aggressively as Pete it's got to rub off on his players and I'm thinking that we're going to do well fare pretty well in our next 40 games. Bill Russell the dean of the LA Dodgers was honored in Los Angeles this weekend with a night of his own. Only three other Dodgers have played in more games if you count Brooklyn and Los Angeles and that's something that amazes the shortstop from Pittsburgh Kansas. Who would ever think that I would outlast to Steve Garvey, who meant so much to the Dodger uh, organization, did so many great things here, and, and with the fans, uh, he's gone, and, and a guy like me was in the background for so many years, and which was my personality, and, and which was my choice, but I could stay here and outlast all of them. While the Cubs and Mets have been changing places on top of the NL East, the Phillies have quietly been holding on to third place, within striking distance of the top. We respect the Mets a great deal. We respect the Cubs a great deal. A lot of them came from our organization. And uh, it's going to be a dogfight uh, down to the wire. Hopefully we can make it that way and get a part of it. Being six games out right now, uh, is, it just might be where we'd like to be. You know, what the heck? That's where we are. we got to play, play with reality, and that's where we are. And there's nothing wrong with really closing strong. That's what the Phillies and Mike Schmidt are looking to do. This week it's East playing West, so there won't be any play inside these pennant races, but this is the way it shapes up heading into the week. The New York Mets, after their one game over 500 week, are but three games back. The Phillies six back. The Expos, after that week, are ten games back, still with an outside chance at the pennant chase, as are the St. Louis Cardinals. The Pirates, 20 and a half games back. Over in the Western Division, San Diego continues to hold status quo with their lead after they had a one under 500 week. The Braves can't get anything going. Houston did get something going, but they're still nine and a half games back in that Western Division. And San Francisco is further back than they have ever been since their move to San Francisco back in the 50s. Looking at the leaders in Major League Baseball in the National League, Tony Gwynn continues to set the pace among the hitters with a 360 mark. That is 41 points better than second place Ryan Sandberg. Dale Murphy has 27 home runs. Mike Schmidt next with 25. Carter's next with 24. And Ribby's Carter sets the place with 87. And in the uh, uh, stolen base categories, Juan Samuel sets the pace with 56. Alan Wiggins next with 52. And Timmy Raines, one back with 51. Among the pitchers in the National League, Joaquin Andujar with 16 victories. One better than Charlie Lee. Mario Soto is next back with 13. Uh, Alejandro Pena with a 2.34 ERA continues to lead there. Just a shade better than Dave Dravecki. Dwight Gooden with 193 strikeouts is uh, six better than Fernando Valenzuela. And Bruce Souter with 33 saves continues to set the pace there. Jesse Roscoe is next with 27. Those are the statistics through Sunday in the National League. One of the things Pete Rose is going to count on in his effort to get the Cincinnati Reds moving again, whether or not they get back into the pennant race really isn't his concern, is just to get them to play good baseball again, will be the performance of this man, Mario Soto. Soto, with 13 victories, remains among the leaders in the National League in the win categories, but sometimes what news he makes off the field detracts from what he does on the field. Lou Palmer has more. Mario Soto is getting older and getting better. In 1982, he placed second in the National League in victories with 17 and strikeouts with 242. 
His 18 complete games were tops in the league on a Reds team that finished 14 games under 500 and in last place. While the Reds have shown little improvement in 1984, Soto is quickly earning a reputation as one of baseball's most revered pitchers. So far, is uh, is the best year I ever, the, the best start I ever have, and uh, I just hope that I can uh, continue to have uh, the uh, the same uh, half a year, the last part of the year, can pitch the same way I pitched the first part, and uh, I think. Uh, um, if I pitch that way, um, I might come up with a, the best uh, year I ever have. While it is an outstanding year on the mound, incidents like this may be giving him even greater notoriety. But the most important things to Mario are his relationships with his teammates and his pitching performance. The controversy is something he would rather forget. Well, I'm really not talking about that because uh, I believe uh, that's all in the past and I'm just uh, going to continue to pitch uh, the way I pitch. Things like that just happen, right? That happen whatever you are. Even, even if you're walking down the street, you're walking in the factory, that's going to happen to you. So uh, uh, I'm going to just leave that thing behind me and uh, just continue to play my game. As Soto continues to run past the rest of the National League, one of his toughest obstacles will be overcoming negative criticism. But those who have had to hit against him remember the heat and the finesse coming from the right arm of Mario Soto. And that's the way it should be. For Inside Baseball, I'm Lou Palmer, ESPN. And many of those that have to hit against him call him the best pitcher in baseball. We'll go from the National League to the American League when we return to Prudential's Inside Baseball. <laughs> A little girl was trapped. I had to... When we hit the All-Star break back in July, there were some detractors who said, just wait a while, the Minnesota Twins would fade away in the American League West. Then when we hit August, some of those detractors faded away themselves because the Twins were still there. And now as we head to the final six weeks of the pennant race, the Twins in the West are anxious to prove they're for real. The Minnesota Twins continue to rule the West after taking three of five in Fenway over the weekend. Kent Herbick and his teammates have played loose all year. So what must they do the rest of the way? Stay confident and uh, go out there with a, with a good state of mind. Don't put any pressure on ourselves and have fun. Well, I, I like the way the kids are handling it. They're not looking ahead. They don't talk pennant. They know it's a long year yet, and we got a lot of clubs we have to go through yet, but uh, they handle it real well, and uh, I just like the atmosphere on the ball club and, and the way everything's going so far. Over in the East, the Red Sox are still a long way from first place, but thanks to some young talent like Rich Gedman, the future is looking brighter in Boston. We have great personnel here. I think uh, it's a shame that Detroit got off to such a great start. Um, it could really be a dogfight right now. I mean, between four or five teams. It's just a shame that, you know, they get out so far and now you're kind of going, well, I don't know what kind of chance we got. But if we can go out there and, and play with a positive attitude, go out and enjoy ourselves, have fun, you know, enjoy the game. When you win and you have fun. There is a dogfight going on in the American League East, but it's not for first place. It's for second and third place. This is the way it stands after this past week. The Tigers still one game over 500. Toronto one game under. Baltimore one game over. But nobody really has been able to put a charge onto the Tigers in the Eastern Division. Milwaukee drops to one and five. They are now 28 and one half games back. Over in the Western Division, the Twinkies continue to set the pace. Four games ahead of the California Angels, a slump to two and five. Kansas City, one game over 500, is five back. The yeah, Ash, Chicago, and Oakland still very much in it, and Seattle and Texas can't completely rule them out in the American League Western Division. Among the leaders in the American League, going into this week after Sunday's competition in hitting, Dave Winfield and Don Mattingly continue to battle for the top spot in hitting. And home runs, Tony Armas with 33, three better than Dave Kingman. And Ribbies, Kong with 99 sets the pace there. Alvin Davis and Jim Rice next with 93. And in stolen bases, Henderson has 49. Gary Pettis of the Angels is next with 44. In pitching, in victories, Petrie, Boddicker, and Morris all have 15 so far. Steve with a 2.48 ERA sets the pace. Storm Davis, 2.67. And Boddicker next, 2.77. Mike Witt with 153 Ks is but two better than Mark Langston of Seattle. And in saves, Quiz has 32. Caudill has 27. Those stats through Sunday in the American League. 
If the Detroit Tigers do hold on to win the American League championship, you can bet a lot of people are going to be getting credit for that championship season. Now, one of the fellows who certainly should deserve a lot of that credit resides in center field. He has one of the best gloves and one of the best bats in that position in either league. It's Chester Lemon. Ed Randall has more for Inside Baseball. He is a lemon in name only. Chester Lemon's years of playing in the shadows appears to finally be at an end. Lemon, a lifetime 281 hitter and as good a defensive center fielder as there is in the game, feels that if the public is not aware of his skills, his fellow players are. I've always been respected by my peers. I just think that um, the kind of recognition that um, Warren gets is you have to either play in New York or Los Angeles or you have to be having a superstar type of year. And it's just not enough to hit 300 and do the other things because there's a lot of players that, you know, had those kind of years. And I think this year, because we have an exceptionally good ball club, we're getting more recognition. One commandment of baseball is that good teams are strung up the middle defensively, behind the plate, at second and short, and in center field. Detroit may be the strongest in the game with Parrish, Whitaker, and Trammell. Last year, all three won American League gold gloves at their position. Lemon lost out, though, in center field to Dwayne Murphy of Oakland. I think what happens is that when you give golden gloves to practically everybody on your team, somebody's going to come up on the short end. And, and we had Lance and Lou and Tram, and I think they just thought it was too good to be true to have four of us, and, and that's what happened. You know, I was running up to the golden glove for about three or four years in a row to, to Fred Lynn, so it just seems like <laughs> I always count as somebody that's, you know, that's always having an outstanding defensive year, but I really believe this year that I'll get it this year. I, I don't know. I, for some reason, I just feel that way. If nothing more, because of all the attention that we've gotten. Detroit manager Sparky Anderson, a man not generally given to understatement, once said that if a ball drops in center field, it is either uncatchable or Lemon is sitting behind him in the dugout. Chester Lemon's one of those guys that if it stays in the ballpark, he's going to catch it. I, I think he's the best center field in all of baseball, and, and I think our club feels that way. He catches everything that's hit. Well, I like to think I'm a complete player. You know, I, I try to do everything. I work hard on offense. I work hard on defense. And I think that... Um, we probably got more recognition defensively because everybody talk about how strong we are up the middle. It's Lance and Lou and Tram and myself. So naturally, I think that we probably gotten more publicity defensively than we have offensively. And because of that, now it is the Detroit Tigers who have no lemons for sale. For Inside Baseball in New York, I'm Ed Randall, ESPN. Some may say he's underrated, but for anybody who knows the game of baseball, he's right at the top as a competitor and as a performer. More honors for little Louie, that and more when we return to Prudential's Inside Baseball. major milestones for some great major leaguers this past week. First with the bats, Ron Say of the Chicago Cubs picked up his 1,000 and 1,000 and first career ribbies. And that sets him apart from the rest with over 1,000 ribbies. For George Foster, who started his career with the Giants, moved on to Cincinnati where he picked up most of his ribbies and now plays for the Mets. Foster has now passed the 1,100 mark in that career total. And for Juan Samuel, who continues his blistering pace as a rookie, he now has 56 stolen bases, that best of the old Philly record set back in 1907 by Sherry McGee. And for the Tigers, they continue to blister the turnstiles, over 2 million so far. That breaks the 1968 mark set by the Tigers. That, of course, the last time they won the world championship. They now have 42 straight home dates of 25,000 or better. This was also a big week for Louis Aparicio. Last week, he was inducted into Baseball's Hall of Fame, and this past week, his number, number 11, was retired by the Chicago White Sox. For little Louie, he was greeted by Jack Brickhouse and then had his number retired as it was handed to him by Rudy Law, the man who presently was wearing the number with the White Sox. Rudy will now wear number 23. For Aparicio, he joins Appling, Minoso, and Fox as the only four to have their numbers retired with the White Sox. It was a memory he'll never forget. Well, every time I come into this ballpark, you know, it's going to give me a little pimple because that was the first park where I wore my first big league uniform. And little Louie told us that at that time it was a dream, almost impossible dream, for him ever to make it to the Hall of Fame or certainly to have his number retired. 
that has come his way. While this was the year that Louie was inducted into baseball's Hall of Fame, another Hall of Famer was honored this past week. They're rolling off the presses in Washington, D.C., they being the Roberto Clemente stamp. The great Pittsburgh Pirate veteran was honored by still another in the series of baseball stamps. Roberto Clemente, justly honored for his deeds as a player and as a humanitarian. We'll have more when we return to Prudential's Inside Baseball. We'll be joined by Gus Heffling, the guru of the Phillies. Peak performance, that's something that each one of us strives for each day, but only a few of us are able to attain. That is the lifelong job of one man, though. I'm talking of Gus Heffling the man who's the guru of the Philadelphia Phils. Believe it or not, you're looking at a training session for baseball players. It's under the tutelage of maybe the best in the business, Gus Heffling of the Philadelphia Phils. I personally believe that conditioning does tell a story in a pennant race. I think that, uh, well, hitting and running, as you mentioned, are skills. And the skills require strength and flexibility to perform. And without strength, without flexibility, you cannot do it. And, uh, I know that conditioning is the answer. Part of the answer, anyway, when you get down to the summer months and the 6th, 7th, 8th, and ninth innings, that's the answer. For Gus, in his eighth year with the Phils, it's a job, yes, but it's much more than that for him and for the players. Gus is fantastic. I, I really have a special feeling for Gus, not so much because um, uh, he has really helped me out as far as the uh, physical part goes, but what he is helping me with, though, is a part of him and he gives himself to you in order to make you a better athlete and and that i really feel and i i'm really thankful for that and he has a he's a dedicated individual and he sacrifices a lot and i do appreciate that his prize pupil no doubt about it lefty steve carlton who has parlayed gus's brand of chinese and japanese styles of karate into consistent performances year after year He's a very, very competitive individual. He's one in 10 million. I've only seen a couple of men like him in my entire lifetime, let alone my career. And, uh, there, there won't be many of him around. I mean, uh, he's a genetic, he's genetically, he's different. Uh, how can I say it? Whoever put him together did one heck of a job. <laughs> While Gus's tactics work for some, they're not for everybody, though. Yeah, I don't knock Gus's system because, it's, you know, I've seen the work for Lefty, it works for J.D., it's been working for Charlie and, I mean, all the other guys that work with him, it works. But, you know, I just have a philosophy that, you know, if it's not going to help me throw strikes, then why bother, you know? <laughs> but uh, it's a great conditioning program, and uh, the guys, they do it, you know, all season long, and, and they stay strong all season. Uh, luckily, you know, I've been doing it a certain way for a long, long time, and it hasn't failed me yet. So I feel that I'm not going to change a boat in the middle of a stream. We are all individuals. We try to, uh, you know, cater to their individual needs. Remembering the basic laws of physics apply to all of us, more or less, and sometimes a whole lot less. By the way, Storm Davis of the Orioles told me he credits his start this year to Gus's program. The final word after this. 